<laughs> All right. Good evening. It is Tuesday, 7 p.m., which means it is Tasting Tuesdays. Time to sip, drink, snuff, swirl, have some fun. So pull up a chair, put aside an hour, and join us for what is bound to be hopefully educational, but hopefully an incredible tasting of, uh, of Cab Sav wine. So who's the first one on tonight? That distinction goes to Laura Brown. Good evening. Followed very closely by Janice Bryant. There's Paul Carney. Um, hi, guys and girls, obviously. Uh, as always, let's give it a, a few minutes. Let's welcome folks. But um, just to let you know, obviously, we're dealing with big wines tonight. We're dealing with Cab Sav. And I cannot tell you how, how pumped I'm excited to have. Hope you've been uh, giving them some time, some aeration, some oxidation. Grab some glasses. I've got my two bags. My bag is my big ass glass. Um, because Cabernet requires a glass that that really sort of opens the wine up and exposes it to oxygen um, But super 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 excited. So these wines you could have decanted for sort of three to four hours um, But yeah, we're talking about Cab Sav. Who else is there? Susan Glenn. There's the Sugamellis. Valerie wearing my new t-shirt uh, Take a photo and send Jeff Thorpe, Beth Smith, Schaffer Meyer, OH Susan Swain is there. Hello. How are you Susan? Let's see, uh, Cameron Pastor, I believe if I butchered that, I apologize. Earl Greaser, again. Um, hi, everybody. Hope you've had a wonderful, wonderful day, my lord. Um, Bessmith, bag. Yeah, big ass glass. It's what you need for Cabernet. I've got two bags here. Uh, Marsha says, Dennis, Marsha, Darcy, and Aaron, hi to everyone. Uh, got my bag in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Hello from uh, the Great Lake State. Charlie Winfrey, Donna Goff, Michael France, Sarah Elizabeth Crown with a wave and a glass of wine. Absolutely. So um, there are the Mendenhalls in, uh, in Spring, Texas. Hello, the Mendenhalls. So what we're tasting tonight, if you've got it, is the last of our barrel samples. And those are the two Cabernets. So it uh, doesn't matter which one's which. Just don't mix them up. But there goes the 2017 my word, I have been waiting such a long time to taste that wine, and I can't wait to, to share it with you. Um, Dennis says, we also have the 2014. <whistles> now we're talking, uh, pulling out all the big guys. So, Dennis, let me know how that develops over the over the course of the of the next couple, right? Uh, Drew and uh, Kevin Norfleet, very much awake this time. Thank you for joining us, big guy. I was wondering if you would make it this time. And there's the, the 2019. So let's give it one more minute. Uh, just to welcome, get everyone situated, get your wines. Um, these cabs are a little on the cooler side, which I don't mind. It just means that they're going to warm up and they're going to aerate as we do this. And the wines are going to show much more expressively and they're going to change in the glass. And I think for purposes of side-by-side -side tastings, that's it. But again, uh, this is very much your personal preference. But two big glasses. Two big wines from Keswick Vineyards from a varietal uh, that is really, really tough to, to grow. So let me see who else is there. Uh, James Belitho, Dave Maddox, Haley Anderson, I.O. indeed. Um, didn't know you were a Buckeye fan, Haley, but it's good to see you. Linda Haas, uh, love you, even though what we're Penn State folks over there, I believe. Um, yeah, got my wife. Uh, Alakai is a little sort of fussy on the side there, so bear with us. Um, but let's get let's get started. Let's uh, jump into a varietal that I am super, super, super excited about. Um, let's answer your questions again. Shoot them uh, if you have. Brenda Woodman, uh, all the way from Queensland, Australia. A bit early for wine for us, but nonetheless, it's it's so love to have you, Mrs. Woodman. Hope you and your family are doing well. God bless. And uh, send my best to, to Sean, Trevor, and uh, Robert. Hope uh, hope you guys are all doing well in uh, in Australia. So, um, Mary Gabrunas, I love the happy background noise. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's much more tolerable at 7 in the morning than 2 in the morning. 7 in the evening than 2 in the morning. But, uh, yeah, happy to have him. So, hey, folks, welcome. Welcome to the last of our barrel tasting sessions. And tonight we're focusing on a varietal that... 
Virginia is not exactly known for. Um, we're going to tell you why Keswick sometimes has a has a decent shot at actually making this wine. Uh, we're going to taste it. We're going to delve into Cabernet, and uh, hopefully we're going to answer some questions. Then we're going to talk about how you can get these wines. We're going to talk about what we're going to do next Tuesday and what the August bundle will look like. So a lot to get through. So uh, welcome. Excited to have you. And as always, Firstly, let's start off with some sort of, you know, positivity. Hope your families are doing well. Hope you're doing well. Um, I hope you've had a wonderful, wonderful weekend. The other thing, I just want to shout out to my beautiful wife. Uh, it's our anniversary on Saturday, August 1st, 11 years. So she's right there. I'm not doing it because she's right there, but happy anniversary, love. Love you. Can't believe you've stuck with me that long, but can't imagine being with anybody else. And um, what, a, what, a, what an awesome day. All right. Talking about Cabernet, and what we're talking about is the progeny of Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. Because Cabernet Sauvignon is actually the offspring of a white and a red varietal, Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. And they think sometimes in the 17th century, and they think the, the sort of the history of it again is, is Romans, but honestly, it is the most widely planted red grape uh, in the world. It seeds Merlot in terms of planting, and honestly, other than maybe Pinot Noir, who has this sort of ethereal kind of nature to it, I think Cabernet, when you talk about Cabernet Sauvignon, you're talking about the world wine grape. You're talking Cabernet in the Cunawara, um, you know, grown on the Terra Rossa soil over there. You're talking about Cabernet grown in South Africa. You're talking about Cabernet growing in South America, obviously Napa Valley in this part of the world. Um, but it's, it's probably, you know, most famous, I would think, even though it's not really a single varietal, but it's the wines of Bordeaux, which really, 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 really raise the, the benchmarks for Cabernet. Obviously, they're blended. Um, and when we talk about Cabernet-based wine, we're talking about the left bank, you know, the appellations of uh, Saint-Julien, uh, Pouillac, Saint-Estephe, um, you know, what else is there? Margot, the Homme d'Arc, you know, the pesac Lyonnais region over there. But they're generally blended with uh, Cabernet Franc or Merlot or sometimes Petit Verdot. But we are talking about a wine that, you know, when you talk about wine, everyone knows Cabernet. And I think everyone has an expectation of what Cabernet is. Now, when we talk about Virginia, Virginia is a tough grape, uh, is a tough place in which to grow grapes. I mean, let's face it, you know, we need a, a lot of help from Mother Nature. We need a long growing season. And in terms of sort of the Winkler classification system, we're on level three which means theoretically we should not really be able to ripen Cabernet Sauvignon. We don't have enough growing degree units. Now, what is a growing degree unit? We're working on the assumption that vines grow from uh, April 1st to October 31st, right? And they only grow above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So a growing degree unit or a growing degree day is the average temperature. So in other words, you had a high of 90, you had a low of 60, that's 150, 75 is the uh, average. You take away 50 and you get 25 degree or 25 growing degree units, right? Now to get Cabernet ripe, theoretically we need about 180 days of a growing season. Uh, we need a lot of heat. So where does Cabernet do incredibly well? Um, you know, when you talk about big, voluptuous, hedonistic, extracted wines, you're always looking at sort of warmer climates. And that's why in America, it thrives in, in the vineyards of Napa Valley. Cooler sites make Cabernet, but they tend to be a little bit more sort of olivey and eucalyptus-y, really, really interesting. They have a lovely sort of herbaceousness that comes through over there. But when you think of Cab, and, and jump in here and let me know what you expect when you drink a Cab, but I expect sort of dark fruits, you know, cedar, cigar box, tobacco, um, blue and black fruits, the blueberries, the blackberries, the plums, the cassis, you know. Um, but what I'm not looking for is the over extracted nature of Cabernet. You know, you're not looking for sort of those jammy, almost sort of sweet derived flavors. I'm not looking for a Cabernet that has got so much oak you felt like you've swallowed a two by four. Because again, the philosophy for me and for us is that wine really has to reflect the site in which it's grown, that, that notion of terroir. Because let's face it, every winery has access to barrels and grapes and winemakers and vineyard managers and sprays and stuff. Again, the only thing that makes us unique, makes us somewhat individualistic, the only DNA or fingerprint of our winery is, is the soil. It's the vineyard, it's the soil, it's the elevation, it's the age of the vines, it's the row orientation, all of which creates that little berry that is so unique and so 
unto its own. And honestly, we want to make sure that we grow the best fruit and make a wine that's expressive of sight. All right, so let's talk Virginia. Let's talk about the grape. Um, you know, again, when we talk about Cabernet Franc, which we tasted last week, I think, you know, folks are sort of a little bit sort of, um, you know, kind of, they, they agree that sometimes there's some herbaceousness in there. You know, some people like that sort of bell pepper flavor. And we were talking about those pyrazines, those mustoxy pyrazines, the isopropyl and isobutyl pyrazines, which are very, very common in Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon. And when you try Cabernet Franc around the world, whether it's in Bourguet or Sumer Champigny or in the Chinon, you almost expect that sort of leafiness and that sort of herbaceousness. But when it comes to Cabernet, if your Cabernet tends to be on the greener side, um, a lot of people feel that that is, that is not really indicative of what Cabernet is. That screams underripe. That screams physiological underripeness. Okay, so the first thing we got to get off the bat is Virginia and Keswick cannot, cannot produce Cabernet every single year. All right. Um, as much as we have incredibly well-drained soils, and if you've missed us in the past, um, there are soils, you know, shale, schist, you know, and the Manio series, it, it, it kind of evacuates water incredibly well. And, and again, just to recap, we get around 40 to 45 inches of water a year. In years like 18, 11, and 3, when we're getting 80, 90 inches of water a year, it doesn't matter how big your slopes are or how steep the gradient is or how well drained, you know, there's just access to water. And with that growing season, you know, we realized very quickly and in others that we cannot produce a single varietal cab. Because again, we don't want to, we're selfish. We don't want to make the, the best Cabernet in Virginia or try to. We want to make Cabernets that, that belong in the conversation of the world-class examples. Are we there yet? Absolutely not. We've still got a lot of work to do. Have we really improved our wines? Absolutely. And I think the best wines are still to be made. Right. So the one reason Keswick has a great chance in certain years to make Cabernet again is our is our soil. Um, but in years like the 11, the 3 and the 18, quite honestly, we would be doing a disservice to you, the customer, the wine club member, anyone that visits us to try and make a $75 bottle of Cabernet Estate Reserve and even pretend pretend to think that it's as good as the 17s, the 19s, the 14s, the 10s, and the 9s. Um, the other thing is we only started making Cabernet in 2007, even though we had the grape planted in 2000. Up until that point, Cabernet was used exclusively as a blending component in our Bordeaux wine, which is aptly known as Heritage. Again, a lot of people say, why Heritage? Let me explain. The first wine we came out with had 10% Tariga Nacional in the blend. It was Merlot, Cab Franc, Cab Sav, and Tariga. And those that know Tariga, um, it's a Portuguese varape, so it's non-Bordeaux. So in 2002, we made what we call the Heritage. And then in 4 and 5, 6 and 7, um, those wines were exclusively Bordeaux, but the name just stuck. And then in 2007, we decided that, hang on, we, we have a varietal and a, and a Cabernet that, that's quite delicious and it deserves to be bottled on its own. Um, it had some Merlot blended into it, you know, because if it's labeled as a Cabernet, it only needs to be 75%. So we put a little bit of Merlot into it as well. We bottled it and that was our first Governor's Cup winning wine with a Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, we didn't make one in eight. We did nine, 10. We skipped 11 and 12, 11 being the wet year, 12 was sort of okay, but we didn't feel that we could make a wine that was on par with the 10, which was the previous vintage of the cab. And then we had a great run of vintages, the 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Now, what happened in 17? We decided to bottle multiple Cabernet wines. In previous vintages, the 14, the 15, the 16, they've been a blend of all the blocks on our property specifically the block three that was planted in 2005 and the block seven which is our oldest block on the property and then in 2017 we felt that we had the volume and we had the quality to really express two very 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 different grapes um 18 we we didn't make cap you know and that's because we we could not make a wine as good as the the 17 and then 19 you know, um, we felt like, here we go. We're back on the wagon. We're back on it as well. So 
Um, we need help. We need help from Mother Nature. We need a long growing season um, because we don't want to harvest fruit under ripe. And again, you know, ripeness is not a measurement of sugar. A lot of people say, so what are the bricks that you harvest the grapes at? It's sort of inconsequential because I could harvest a 23 bricks as long as the seeds are brown and the tannins are developed and it's not chalky and bitter and astringent. It's, it's more sort of savory and the flavors are amplified. Um, you can get physiological ripeness at lower sugar levels depending on site. So we look at sugar obviously because sugar really transfers to alcohol. And again, we're not trying to make wines that are 15, 16, 17%. But at the end of the day, these wines are age worthy, they sell are worthy, but if you drink them, They've got to be drinkable. And again, when you have wines that are so alcoholic, they're just bloody hard to drink. And the whole point of making wine is that we, we want to drink them, right? So we need, a, we need a growing season that helps us. You know, you got to do your canopy management. You can't overcrop. You got to expose the grapes to, to sunlight. But theoretically, if we can pick 180 days after bud break, I think we have a good chance to, to make a decent Cabernet Sauvignon. All right, how do we do it? We pick by hand into the 25 pound lug boxes. It gets chilled straight away for, for anywhere from 12 to 24 hours, get that fruit nice and cold, destemmed, sorted, transferred to, um, to the fermenter. Now fermentation could be in open top stainless steel, could be in concrete, could be wood vessels, or it could be in plastic bins. So fermentation again is that process of uh, sugar turning into alcohol, carbon dioxide gets released, heat is generated because um, ferments are exothermic, they give off heat because they have to produce energy in the form of ADP, which is adenosine, adenosine triphosphate. Um, and then, you know, we use yeast and we don't. You know, part of what we want to do is express the microflora of the vineyard. You know, again, it's all about the expression of that sort of individuality. And it's the yeast that comes in on the skins. It's the microflora that comes in on the grapes. And if the grapes are clean, you know, there's no rot. There's no bird damage. We're not dealing with botrytized or vinegar rot or anything like that. And we get really, really clean fruit into the fermenter. We ferment the wines ambiently or uncultured. Um, we do also use cultured yeast. And the reason for that is just for, you know, kind of controlling the process, knowing, you know, the yeast sort of nutritional status, knowing sort of the kind of flavors that we need, knowing the alcohol tolerance. Um, and, and so it goes. The intention with these wines is really one for age worthy. It's for development in the cellar. Um, we make certain wines that we know are going to get bottled and come onto the shelves a little earlier. These are wines that honestly, if you buy, you know, I, I wouldn't call it an investment in terms of a financial investment. But if you think of an investment in terms of a of an experience, in terms of intellectually or emotionally, um, Cabernet is really gonna develop in the glass. It's gonna develop secondary and tertiary aromas. And these wines sing. They drink beautifully five to eight, eight to 10, um, and sometimes even longer. So again, you know, we treat it very minimalistically by doing a lot of work in the vineyard. You know, again, that's where all the potential of a wine comes from. If we have phenomenal fruit on the crush pad, we have the potential to make phenomenal wine. If we get substandard fruit on the crush pad, there's a lot we can do, but the ultimate wine is going to reflect the nature of the vintage and of the grapes as well. The one thing I want to talk about a, a little bit is, is the use of oak. Um, again, you look behind us, those are some of the barrels that we use. The Cabernet the 2017 that you're going to try it comes from the barrel. If you're looking at me uh, to the right of me, you know, over my left shoulder, right over there as well. And you can see we're using puncheon style barrels, which are 500 liter, which is a larger barrel than the typical 225 or 228 liter barriques. Again, the intention is if you've got this beautiful fruit and this beautiful wine that's expressive, we don't want to mask the, the aromatic potential and the flavors and all the things that are derived from the grape. We don't want the wine to smell woody. We don't want the, the wine to taste woody. That's going to just mask the inherent flavor of the wine, the individuality of the grape itself. So the 17 is um, block seven. The 19 is also block seven. I thought it'd be really cool to try, obviously, two different vintages, but from the exact same block. Both of these wines are still in barrel. The 17 is going on its third year Elevage. You know, it gets bottled August 20th, and at that point, it would have spent 32 months in the barrel. 
The 19 is, is young. It's in the same um, size barrel. It's in a 500 liter barrel. But as opposed to the sort of the neutral oak, meaning that there's sort of four or five year and three year barrels on the um, on the 17, the 19 has a little bit more newer oak. There's a couple, it's about 30% new oak and the remainder is second and third. All right, so let's jump into it because I think Cabernet is so, um, firstly, you, you look at it and if you look at this color, and uh, let me do it this way rather, you can see that that is dark, you know, because again, wine is so psychological, it's experiential, it's emotional, right? You know, decent wine is going to taste amazing with the right people, with the right food. Um, great wine in, in an ambience, you know, it's it's wine is experiential and emotional and intellectual um, but when you pour wine into a glass you know Cabernet has this sort of density to it and its richness to it and again your, your first thing you do is you see the wine you know if this wine was pink and light and you could see through it I mean immediately I'm going mm, that that's that's not exactly what I think of, of Cabernet um, you can see both wines have beautiful extraction if you look at the the wine throughout the glass there's a uniformity of color. You're not seeing, um, for me anyway, I'm not seeing any sort of brick red color. I'm not seeing any sort of orange rims or anything like that. It has a, a beautiful core of a really opaque, gone, it's almost purple color, and it's uniform throughout the glass, which really indicates the wine is young. All right. So firstly, you go, serious wine, it's got color, it's got extraction. This is, this is something to take notice for. But at the end of the day, it's all about this, and then it's about this. So it's that time. It's time to give the wine a sniffy sniff. Now, jump back and forth. doesn't matter if you start with the 17 or the 19, um, but let's give them a sniff. And again, we're, we're swirling the glasses. Um, what we're doing is we're volatilizing the esters, and the esters are, are these products that are a reaction between carboxylic acids and alcohols. They smell. They're odiferous. And volatility, by definition, means the ability to vaporize. So you're volatilizing all these esters. They're going in the glass, and the shape of the glass is going to concentrate it so really dive down deep and, and give them a smell. So I'm going to start with the 19. Why not go with the younger wine? And then go back and forth. Different nose, right? Um, I think the, the, the nose on the 17 is probably a little bit more amplified. You would expect that. Um, you know, the 19 the only been in barrel for about nine months or so. You know, yeah, you're talking about sort of 33 months. So you expect the nose to be different. And there's an amplification on the 17. The 19, for me, and, and these wines are a little bit on the chilly side, I've got to admit. Um, the 19 is a little bit sort of muted. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put the 19 to the side. I'm going to allow that to breathe and aerate and open up. And hopefully warm up as well. So let's focus on the 17. Um, and this is... This has been a project that I've been dying, dying to, to get into, into, the, into the bottle, which we do pretty soon. So again, beautiful color, beautiful extraction. Um, let's get that nose. Immediately, a lot of sort of graphite, pencil lead, pipe tobacco, um, you know, sort of tar, black tea. Really sort of typical and, and very expressive Cabernet sort of descriptors that you would use. You know, Cabernet doesn't really gravitate towards sort of the red fruit spectrum, like the cherries, the raspberries, the strawberries. I always think like Merlot or Pinot for that. It doesn't have that sort of leafiness or that herbaceousness that Cabernet Franc can have. Um, you know, it doesn't have that sort of peppery of, uh, of Syrah, like the Northern Rhone. You know, it's got really savory, you know, sort of violet, um, but really sort of dark, toasty kind of kind of flavors. It has this really great sort of minerality to it as well, almost like a, a graphite, you know, like rocks um, that you hit together. It's it's a really complex and interesting nose. All right, so you know we'll come back to it and see it. So so let's jump in and take a sip. And when you take a sip, take one, rinse it around your mouth, swallow it, and then let's jump in. And what you want to look for is is obviously the entry because that's the acidity and the fruit. And then you want to really focus on sort of the transition to the mid palate and the back. And with this wine, what I'm hoping, and I haven't tasted it yet, is that it has this really seamless and flowing integration. We're looking for, you know, a an iron fist in a velvet glove, power, structure, but we're looking for that ballerina, not for that linebacker. We're looking for that grace and that elegance, and we're looking for that sort of longevity on the finish, right? So cheers, guys and girls. Hope uh, everyone's doing well. So first quick sip. I'm not spitting this out tonight. This is too damn good. Okay. And you 
you wait, and it's still there. And you wait, and it's still there. This is serious. This is big. Those tannins are chewy, but in a good way. You know, uh, tannins, again, are polyphenolic compounds that by definition precipitate and bind with proteins. So they're reacting with the, uh, the protein in your saliva. That's why you're tasting the tannins over here. It doesn't have a lot of acid. I mean, it does, but, you know, the acid is not the dominant trait. And acid, you normally get up front of the palate. So this has really got this beautiful entry, but it all sits in that mid to sort of back palate as well. Um, again, flavor-wise, let's just jump back into it. Really dark fruits, you know. Um, I'm getting a lot of sort of black currants, um, sort of black cherry maybe. But I, I really get this interesting sort of tea component. Um, and I, I hear, you know, Bordeaux are often sort of described in terms of black tea. Um, where it comes from, I'm not 100% sure, but this really is beautiful tea components. And then it also has this really lovely sort of minerality. It has this vibrancy to it as well. The great thing that I, I, I don't get is a lot of sort of primary oak flavors. I'm not getting a lot of sort of like the burnt sugar, the coffee, the mocha, the espresso, the charred barrels. Surprisingly enough, with three years in a barrel, you know, um, the oak is really well integrated. Um, you know, I'm not getting this really disjointed palate, but it is quite tight. It has this sort of tension to it um, that you normally get in young wine. So again, you know, would you be doing yourself a disservice to drink this wine right now? Not if you enjoyed it. If you drunk this wine and pounded it and had it with friends and had it over dinner and you enjoyed it, no love lost. But if you could store this wine in sort of correct cellar facilities, this wine is going to just blow your mind in 5, 8, 10, perhaps longer. All right, so, so let's jump back to the 19. Um, very, very different animal. The vintages, pretty similar. Um, again, 17 and 19 were both vintages where we were sort of picking sporadically a little bit here and a little bit there. And again, my definition really of a good vintage is not how much rain and sunshine is that. It's really the decisions we make, you know, that ultimately impact the wine are decisions we make. So we pick when we want to at sugar levels that we want to, um, you know, and the fruit on both of these vintages were clean as a whistle. They were both hand picked. They come from the same block. Um, it's where our big wind machine is. It's behind the house. It's growing on that beautifully sort of barren soil that drains well. Um, the vines aren't vigorous. The berries are tiny. Um, you know, it's it's just beautiful fruit to work with. Minimalistically handled. Um, now we're starting to get some aromas over there as well. It just needs to open up. You know, this is this is a little shy. You know, you just got to coerce it and, and, and sort of it's going to reward you with patience, right? So probably a little bit sort of smokier, you know, almost like a, um, a grilled meat, you know, when you put meat on a barbecue and that sort of smoke and that fat hits the, the grill or the coals and the embers and it sort of comes up, you have that sort of cured meat, grilled meat kind of smell, um, which is really, really interesting, where this to me just tastes a little bit more savory and a little bit more, um, you know, sort of herbaceous, but there's a lot more sort of darker fruits on this one as well. So. I'm gonna jump into the 19 and uh, and let's try it. Okay, the 19's tannins are quite grippy, meaning like you almost suck the moisture out of your mouth. They're not they're not stemmy, they're not chalky, they're not bitter and austere, but they're prevalent. And the tannins right now tend to be a little dominant, which is fine. Because tannin really is part of the structure of the wines. Red wines need tannins. And tannins when they polymerize. And polymerization is when monomers turn into polymers and you get these tannins, these long chains of polyphenolic compounds. The tannins are going to soften. The sediment in the wine, by the way, um, these wines will be unfined, unfiltered. And when that happens in a bottle of wine, that sediment, because when tannins bind with proteins, they actually fall out of solution as well. So sediment is not a bad thing, folks. You know, decanting the wine, putting the wine through a screen is, is not a bad thing as well. It really is an indication that the wine has been minimalistically handled. I know there's a lot of sort of movement towards filtration and, and fining and all of that stuff, which we, which we do. Um, but with the reds uh, and especially the Cabernet, you know, this is, this is the jewel of our portfolio. It really is. Along with our Bordeaux blend, you know, this is a wine that um, we are sort of passionately pursuing 
uh, because we think we have a chance every now and again to make a, a world-class Cabernet as well. So um, what I want to do is just answer some questions, sort of get your feel for the wines, put them aside to the for a little bit, and then come back to them because these wines probably need a few more hours to to open up. So um, let's let's answer. Uh, the first one I'm seeing is what is the Winkler classification system? It's a great question. Uh, it's basically a classification system that puts wine growing regions in specific zones. Uh, the lower the number, the cooler the zone. So, and that comes from Suzanne Barber. So, you know, the warmer zones, um, you know, you think there's parts of Australia, obviously in California and parts of Spain. Um, but on a level of that, the Winkler classification is very simply a, a way to sort of um, rate the zones in terms of weather and temperature. And it's really defined by growing degree uh, units. Let's see, um, which cab should we sip first? You know, for in purposes of, of sort of trying, it doesn't matter. You know, what we really want to do is highlight the vintage difference, maybe the production differences as well. So um, I started with the 19, but if you want to start with the 17, it's, it's quite okay. But what we want to do is get a discussion going about the difference of the wines, because at the end of the day, we always say these wines need to be better than last year, but they cannot be as good as the next. And that's because we're learning. The more we learn, the more the vineyards become mature, the better fruit we grow, the better the wines are going to be. So Kathy Clifton, finally there. Um, what type of soil is the cab planted on? That's Chris Smith. It's under the Manio and the Tatum series soil, but it's a seracidic schist. It's highly acidic. It's really, really well drained. Um, it, it, nutritionally, it's, it's actually devoid. You wouldn't plant corn and tomatoes on there. But it's incredible, incredible soil for Cabernet, mostly because, Chris, it, it really evacuates water. Um, and what we saw in 2018, I know a lot of people sort of crapped on the vintage and went, oh, it was rubbish, it was rubbish. And it was in a lot of ways. But what it really, really did was show us where our best fruit will come from. And when we had a lot of rain and we walked out the next day, you could see the areas that were very waterlogged due to the higher clay content and those areas that were a lot drier. So very, very poor soil. Um, this is grown on a sort of a 3 to 5% slope gradient, so we don't get a lot of natural runoff. But the soils are so well drained, you know, that it evacuates water. And furthermore, what it does is it drives those roots deeper. In years like this, where we've actually gone into a bit of a drought, the roots are going to go and find the water. Um, and if the water is deeper in the soil, those roots are going to go down deeper. And what's going to happen, those vines are going to self-regulate, they're going to be in balance. Um, and, and even the, the vines that are in the grapes or in the ground since 2000, you know, we're dealing with what, 18 years, 20 years? You know, this is young for Cabernet. 30, 40, 50 year old vines are going to make incredible fruit. Um, and the other thing is, we've got another three blocks of Cabernet still coming on. And when we expanded, a lot of people say, why, why the expansion and why take so long? Um, honestly, you know, we wanted to find the characteristics that would allow us to grow Cab, PV, Cab Franc, Merlot, because we really love reds. We love growing reds. So the first thing is we, we wanted to look for the soil. So we did drone work and um, you know we, we looked for those soils and then we planted what we thought were the best clones with the best root socks, you know, the right row orientation, high density planting. And uh, I think as phenomenal as this block seven is, I think our block three, our block two, and the as yet unnamed block in the back might produce um, the best fruit possible. Kathy Clifton, love you and your family. Um, how long do they stay barreled? So Kathy, it's a great question. Thank you for that. Mostly 22 months. Um, every Cabernet up until this point, other than the seven, which was only 10 months in barrel, the, uh, the cabs generally spend two years in the barrel. They get taken out in August and then they get filled you know, for the, for the current vintage. What we wanted to do with the, the, the 17 was really push the envelope. Um, and we decided to, to keep the, the block seven in the, in the barrel a, a year longer. The block three was bottled off to two years, but the block seven will come out in August 20th. The 19, we will see. Um, it's still young. It'll spend at least another year in the, in the barrel. Um, but 22 months is, is as much as we've done up until the 17, which will spend 34 months after that as well. So let's see. Yeah, missing the 12 and the 11, Terry. Um, vintages, we did not make Cabernet. So 2009 was such a phenomenal, phenomenal vintage. And then we went into the drought vintage of 2010. And those cabs, I got to admit, 
weren't exactly my favorite because they were a little on the big side. They were um, they were really extracted. They showed a little bit more alcohol, and um, you know they're probably going to spend more time in the in the cellar than than what we would like. And then when eleven came, that just rained. And again, you know, I I don't understand sometimes how wineries make the same wine, reserve wine, same price each and every year. Um, if a vintage like 11 comes across, unless you have an incredible site, it was very hard to grow ripe, physiologically ripe fruits in 11. And we decided, look, you know, we're not going to BS our customers. You know about wine. You know good wine when you taste it. You know a lot more than sometimes we give you credit for. So what we can do, the only thing that we can do to give this brand transparency and authenticity is to say we're only going to make it in years where we think the quality improves upon the previous vintages. And 11, doesn't matter how, how good I might be or how incredible our vineyard staff was, we could never make a, a wine in 11 that could rival the 10. And then in 12, we, we declassified the Cabernet. We used it as a blending component. We blended it with Merlot and Cab Franc and Petit Verdot, made this beautiful Trevelyan, but we felt that it wasn't quite at that level. And then in 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, uh, we really felt like, hey, these are wines that we are proud to put our estate reserve label on it. These are wines our customers are going to buy and drink and age and have an incredible drinking experience down the line as well. Um, more tannins on the 19, says Dennis. Absolutely. It's because it's young and it's because there's new barrels. Uh, what we will do after the first year is evaluate the 19 and the red. Evaluate that do we have them in the right barrel and what barrel do we age the 19 for the rest of its duration. Um, quite often we'll put it in one barrel and then we'll decide that, you know, we've got the structure, but you know, it's, it's a little too tannic, you know, it's muting the fruit. Then what we'll do, we'll find barrels that are maybe three or four years old, whether they 500 or 225 liter barrels, and then we'll put them in barrel, um, those barrels for another year. We'll top them off periodically, but we won't touch them. Now, again, if we were to, to say we're coming up to bottling, we're a month or two away, and these tannins are really grippy. You know, they're not, we're not talking about underripe tannins, but we're talking about tannins that are dominant. Tannins that really sort of cover up the fruit and the acidity and sort of the, the elegance of the wine. We could go in with egg whites and, and fine it as well. But with these, what we want to do is have you age the wines, let the wines develop, let those tannins soften, allow the fruit that it's masking to come through. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a really sort of tricky thing because we don't know the exact barrels we should putting it. We don't know exactly how long we should be aging the wine for. All we do is drink a lot of wine and sensorially say, hey, you know, we, we think this works. These, um, um, but yeah, so, you know, but yeah, 19 has got more tannins, but it needs to develop. Al says, can you point to the barrels the, the 19 is in? Um, the barrels behind me, you can't see the 19. Al, you know I, I kind of move them around so and, and I hide the thieves so you can't go and taste them. So Aaron says, I smell some creamy chocolate on the 17. Um, okay, um, personally, I, I don't get that right now, but chocolate is, is definitely a flavor profile and a nose that we, we generally get. And I also think, you know, our, our samples, my samples are a little on the cool side. Um, they're probably, you know, high 50s, which is really, 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 probably a touch too cold on the Cabernet. But if you think about Cabernet and experience when you go to a restaurant, right, you're going to sit and have a meal for an hour and a half or two hours, two and a half hours. And if you're with the right person, that night's just going to drag on and it's going to feel like a second, right? What I love about wine is how it changes in the glass, how you have a conversation and you talk and you taste it and you're like, oh, that is wonderful. And then you come back and you're like, Oh, that's different. Um, but for me, I think for, for tasting purposes, these wines need to be a good 5, 10 degrees warmer. And I more than likely would get the, the chocolatey tones on that. I think just purely because my wine is really, really sort of cold, it's it's a little bit muted. I get a lot of fruit and I get a lot of kirsch and I get a lot of sort of darker kind of berry sort of flavors in there as well. But um, I'm sure that with, with aeration and, you know, kind of swirling it, we'll, we'll get it. Cheryl says, I need to change my membership back to monthly. I used to, I used to be, um, then went to silver. So we'll talk about the wine club and why you, why you want to do that as well. So, um, pipe tobacco, Dave Maddox, uh, I'm getting black tea, black cherry and tobacco. Uh, I love it when I, I, 
I kind of describe something and people get it because sometimes I'm like, oh my God, am I full of crap? You know, I'm just coming up with sort of descriptors that you hear about Cabernet. Is it is it really, really there? Uh, Rick Tag, um, my word, Rick Tag, an incredible, incredible winemaker in Northern Virginia. Rick, good evening to you, sir. Uh, the 17 did spend three years in the exact same barrels. We use, um, it's about 30% of the punch and style barrels, Rick. And then the remainder is in uh, 2016, 15, and 14 barriques. The, the barrels haven't moved in, in over two years. We literally just top them off. We taste them and top them off again. We haven't stirred them. Um, you know, the wines are going to get taken out. They're going to get bottled, unfined, and unfiltered. For the first year, though, Rick, um, you know, with the 19, we'll probably take it out of the barrels. We, we've got some new oak on the 19. I can smell them. You know, there's there's really that sort of toasty oak, that um, oaky and smoky kind of flavor that coming through. And I, I think it really, really probably needs to be moved into sort of a neutral barrel just to develop aromatically. And uh, but yeah, the uh, the 17, you know, just just same barrels, just sitting, 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 sitting. Adam Rockhill, the the 17 is world class. Um, you know, smooth oak, not in the face, just adds smoothness and richness. Yes. You know, I appreciate that comment, and I, I really, really appreciate the fact if anyone describes our wine as world-class, um, you know, that is fantastic. Because when I think of world-class cabs, you know, I'm thinking Harlan, you know, Camus, Colgan, Screaming Eagle, you know, Mouton, Latour, Lafitte. Those are the benchmarks of wines in the world. And, you know, I don't think we're there yet, but if you think it's world-class, that is, that is phenomenal. Hopefully we're in the... Uh, in the in the right sort of direction there as well um susan swain says do you have wind machines on other blocks or just on block seven uh thank you for that susan so we have different types of wind machines the the wind machine in the block seven is a, a stationary one it's hooked up there it's on a pad it's bolted to it and it's hooked up to a a short block 450 chevy engine we do have other machines that are movable we have what we call tow and blows uh, we can tow it out into various parts of the vineyard um, we can raise them they're hooked up to smaller engines you know they're oscillating so we have other machines we also have air drains what we call sure farms s-h-u-r um, where it takes the cold air, so you put it in the coolest part of the vineyard and it mixes it up. So we have that particular machine on the Block 7, but we have other machines on the um, on the property as well. Suzanne says, I, I taste more acid on the on the 19. And I agree. I think there's a... Yeah, there's a brightness in the 19 that maybe the, the 17 doesn't have. And again... You know, acidity doesn't always just pertain to whites. Acidity is really, really important to reds in terms of keeping that pH down. But it's all about balance. You know, again, everyone says, how would you describe balance? And really, it is a harmonious interaction between the, the facets of wine. And the facets are really the sugar, the alcohol, the, the fruit intensity, the acidity, and the tannins. Um, but I think there's really a, a brightness and a sort of a vivacity, for a lack of a better word, on the on the 19 where the, the 17 is just beautifully elegant and structured and silky and soft and mature and, and ready for the bottle. You know, this, this goes into the bottle August 20th. And uh, that's Susan's question. When are you planning to bottle the 19? Um, if it like previous vintages, Susan, we would bottle the 19 in August of 2021. Perhaps we had a wonderful, wonderful um, vintage and volume in 19. So perhaps we'll push some back as well and, and bottle it after year three. But most of our cabs really spend 22 months in the barrel. Um, Michael, do you see a difference in the wine using stem versus stemless wine glasses? Uh, I'll be quite honest. I don't really understand stemless wine glasses if someone's out there and loves them please explain it to me as well i know some people go this is how you warm the wine you know and and I, and I get that but you've got oils in your in your hand that mask the glass that are really going to screw up the aromas of the wine so for me um i love stemware um i think there's different shapes i, I like the sort of the bigger tulip shaped glasses as well but i've never quite understood stemless stemless wear so for me i would always go with stemware i think good wine deserves a good glass cheaper wine deserves a good glass um, unless you're having a really bad day in a plastic cup and if you don't have a glass drink it out of the bottle because that is a freaking glass 
How long do you plan leaving the 19 in the barrel? Um, that's a question from Beth Smith. Beth, we don't know. I think that's a product of practicality. You know, at the end of the day, with the 17, the 17 really needs time in the in the bottle after we pull it out of the barrel. The 19, you know, let's let's really evaluate it in in a couple of weeks, um, and we'll decide it definitely at least two years. But then perhaps we'll decide to push it longer. We'll see, you know, what what the reaction to this wine is. You know how it does. Um, 18, obviously, we didn't make a, a lot of reds. Um, you know, we didn't make a single varietal red wine in 18, 20, 20. Obviously, you know, uh, pretty hard hit with the frost. So we don't know. So at least two years, perhaps longer than that. Uh, let's see. Adam Rockhill says, really love the 19. So different than most. Uh, the nose is popping after sitting for a while. Um, not as traditional great as the 17. It's really own thing. Um, yeah, you know. It's interesting that it, it comes from the, the same fruit, the same block. You know, the management thereof is is philosophically the same. The timing thereof is always different. You know, perhaps it had maybe more leaf exposure or less leaf exposure. Maybe it didn't have as much sort of exposure to the sun, so the acidity was a little bit brighter. I don't have the, the chemistry in front of me. I know the sugars were about the same, uh, so the potential alcohol is the same. It's around 14, 14.1%. You know, the oak is a little bit different, but there really is this lovely brightness and this sort of current, you know, I wouldn't say sour, but you could use sour because sour really is just a descriptor of acidity. And I think the acid on the on the on the 19 really comes through beautifully as well. Um, Jeffrey says, Jeffrey Allison, excuse me, says, how long should we let the wine air? And is it OK to just open the bottle or do we need to decant? Um you know, Jeffrey, there, there's no rhyme or reason. There's no rule to say this is how you should drink wine. At the end of the day, it's drink what you like, how you like, when you like. In my opinion, would there be a benefit to giving these wines a few hours in the decanter? Absolutely. I think the wines would be more expressive. You know, if you pull it straight out of the bottle, the wine's going to be muted. It's going to be a bit tight. Um, so if you can, you know, decant it for a few hours, two or three hours with this wine, I think would be sufficient. Um, but do you have to decant it? Absolutely not. Do you, if you want to put an ice block in this red wine and that's how you enjoy it, by God, my man, that's how you got to do it, right? Wine is all about enjoyment. It's about sharing. It's about caring and it's about enjoyment. So drink it in a way that gives you pleasure as well. Um, Laura says, don't name it a number. Just call it the block in the back. The problem, Laura, is we've got about six blocks of Cabernet in the black. Which one are we talking to? Yeah, we've thought about sort of the number, and the number just refers to the fact that it's a seven-acre block. Block three is a three-acre block. It really just keeps my head in in, um, in the right place. But what we want to do with the block, we want to learn, you know, Laura, the, the different blocks, where the best fruit comes from, what's the flavor profile. If you think about, um, if you gave an artist, if you gave Picasso uh, a green, a blue, and a red crayon, and you said, draw something, you know, because of the artistic talent, he's going to do something lovely, right? But if you gave Picasso seven, seven shades of red, seven shades of blue, seven shades of green, imagine the possibilities of what can come on that paper. Think of the wine that way. You know, we might get wines that are heavily expressive, more acidic, more tannic, much more structured. You know, we really, really need to learn where the best fruit comes from. And for me, it's not all about sort of harvesting it, sort of managing it in the cellar and then saying, okay, yeah, the block three is great, the block seven is great, let's blend it together and create a really good wine. I think also the questions that need to be answered is, how does block three look like five years down the line? How did it age according to the seven? How will the 19 age according to the 17? What is it that makes the wine age? When is the best drinking time for our Cabernet? It's a question I get a lot, and it's a question I don't have the answer to. You know, I'm being full of crap when I say five or eight years, but I'm being conservative. Because I think these wines could last probably 10 to 15. I had our 2006 Heritage the other day. It's Cab and Merlot, 80% and 80% uh, Cab, 20% Merlot. It had been in the bottle for 12 years and it showed no signs of atypical decline. It, it had these beautiful aromatics. It had this flor a forest floor and mushrooms and truffle and the tobacco and there was some fruit on the underlying. But I wouldn't say that was past its prime. You know, um, we have to learn. With learning, you know, that allows us to get better. So the block in the back, you know, because a lot of people say, why not just make a Cabernet and make like 1,500 cases, which is what we could do with Cabernet. But I think the really sort of 
um, experiential parts and the curiosity parts of it and and where my brain goes is i want to bottle like five different cabs five different block designates and i'm going to give them to you and say what do you think which one's better why are they different how do they age you know grab these wines and, and let's try them in five years seven years ten years you know let's really learn how how can virginia make cabernet how does keswick make cabernet because cabernet in virginia is a rarity you know um there's some wineries that do it incredibly well in blends i there are very few sort of single varietal cabs out there as well um paul said are they american or french oak paul carney great question thank you very much cab is exclusively in in american oak um uh, in american oak, excuse me my bad in french oak it's not to say american oak is is not a good type of oak uh, because let's face it, Penfolds Grange, which is the iconic Shiraz out of Australia, is exclusively in American oak. So American oak can make world-class wines. What I, I, I find a little disjointed with American oak barrels is, is sort of the inherent sweetness um, that comes from, because it's got a higher vanillin and lignin content. So you have this sort of sucrosity and this polysaccharide sweetness that comes through with American oak barrels that just don't quite fit in with the cab. So we, we tend to go exclusively with, with French oak with our, with our Cabernet as well. Um, Tracy says I'm drinking the 16 Estate Reserve Cab Sav. How is it? Just to let you know, Robert Parker just gave that a 91, which is which is phenomenal. We're so excited about that. And again, all credit to the Vineyard guys who did such a such a such a great job there as well. Um, Michael says, do you blend anything into either of these? Um, Michael, these are 100% varietal Cab Savs. We have blended 2%, 3% Petit Verdot in there sometimes. You know, Petit Verdot can impart color, can impart acidity. Um, you know, we've blended Merlot uh, to soften up the tannins a little bit. But these are 100% single varietal, single sort of geographical area wines, which, which I'm really, really excited about. So one 100% single. Mary says, so if you age a wine the first year all in new oak and the rest of the aging is done in neutral, how would you describe the aging of the wine? Um, I would say that's 50% new oak. So... The, the percentage of new oak um, and the years that you did. So if you did 100% new for two years, I would say that's 50%. Um, some people in the world are still doing 200% new oak. One year in brand new barrels, second year in brand new barrels as well. So I would say that's about 50% new oak, Mary. I hope that um, I hope that answers your question. Cheryl Powell says 16 is amazing. I'm still aging the 14. Uh, the 14... And the nine were, were some of my favorite vintages, Cheryl. I'm so, 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 so glad um, the 16 tastes well. But again, that 16 can last another five to 10 years, no problem whatsoever. So as, as much as you enjoy it, you know, give it some time. I hope you have, um, hope you have, hope you have still some there. Jim McDonald thought this was virtual and these were both still in barrel. Um, Jim, these are definitely in the barrel. And I am not coming to you from the barrel tasting. I have a green screen behind me. And uh, I hope you and Sherry are doing well. God bless you guys. Hey, Mama. Annette Barnard. Hi from Cape Town. Hi, hi Ma. I hope you're doing well. Hit your bio lift. So that, that's my Mama. How do you determine a neutral barrel? Uh, and that's a question from Emery Brisnay. Um, a neutral barrel, sir, is... A barrel that doesn't impart any perceptible oak or oak derived flavors or aromas right so for me that's about five years and beyond so if we're in 20 2019 if I'm using a barrel that's 2014 I'm not getting any perceptible oak derived flavors or aromas that's what I would um, I would regard as a as a neutral barrel so it's a vessel it's so oxidative but what we want is want a softening effect we, want, uh, we don't want the, the oak to be sort of prevalent. So a neutral barrel is a barrel that's been used as many times as it takes for the barrel not to impart any sort of perceptible flavors to, to the wine as well. Let's see what else. Um, dum, 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 dum. Stemless is the best. Uh, they don't break as easily. Fair point, Karina. Uh, Nagib or Najib, I apologize. You know, at the end of the day, you know, my personal opinion is I love stemware. Um, but if you love stemless and that's your thing, absolutely. There, there's no right or wrong answer. It's about your comfort level, your experience. And at the end of the day, you've got to be selfish. You've got to drink a wine in the way, uh, the when, and the how you, you like it as well. Terry says, I'm gravitating towards the 19. Um, I tell you what, Terry, I, I think that is a, a fair point if you were to drink wines today. But 
I think the 17 is the better wine, but it's going to take some time. Um, I think the, the brightness and the acidity and the vivacity of the 19 really makes this a beautiful drinking wine today. But I really think the 17, it's, it's a little sort of muted. Um, it's a little shy. It's going to open up. It's really going to, going to sort of sing in, in sort of a couple of years time. So, but I, I love the fact. I love the fact that you, you think the 19 is better than the 17 and that's what you, you're grabbing right now. So um, let's see what else there is. Sweetie, do you have any questions that I've missed? Um, so Terry has asked, are there other wineries in Virginia bottling a single varietal cab? Um, Terry says, are there any varietals bottling a single cab? Um, I know Barbasol makes a single Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, Pollock Vineyards in Monticello makes a, a single varietal Cabernet Sauvignon. Most others use it as a blending component. Um, you know, Frank, if you're still on there, jump on in and tell me anyone else that's uh, doing single varietal cabs. Uh, but I know in the Monticello... Um, I don't think Jefferson does. I don't think don't think King. I don't think King Family Vineyards even grows Cabernet. Uh, I think Early Mountain uses it as a blending component, but Pollock makes an incredible, incredible uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and Barbasol. And then you have sort of dominant Cabernet-based blends. You know, the one that stands out is obviously the Lost Mountain or the Rendezvous uh, from RDV, and they are. Oh, you talk about world-class wines. What they're doing at RDV is is pretty impressive. Um, but other than that, you know, you don't find many single varietal um, cab savs out there as well. So, so Frank actually is on, and he asked, "Why do you think there are so few varietal cab savs in Virginia? Is it because they can't like them?" Yeah, Frank, um, that's a great question, and I think I I, I may have answered it uh, earlier on in the in the sort of the broadcast, so to speak. But Cabernet really requires a, a growing season that is long and it's dry. I think it finds its home in sort of Mediterranean, hot sort of climates. And I think Cabernet is, is a tough grape to get ripe, you know, especially if you're only doing it five, six, seven times out of the year. Um, it's hard to make rosé from Cabernet if you have to. So I, I think our climate is just not conducive to making Cabernet year in, year out. Because what we want to do is obviously create a portfolio and, and create a consistent wine quality-wise and production level each and year. So I think it's purely climatic. You know, the sites are really, really not that conducive to Cabernet. I just think on our property, we have a, a beautiful site, incredible soils. Again, sir, you said you wanted a gilded, handwritten invitation to come tour the vineyard with me. So please come and say hi to Keswick Vineyards, socially distance, and, and let, me, let me show you. But I think it's very much the, the vintage, the short growing season, the incessant rain, and the fact that most of our soils in Virginia are, are clay based as well. All right. Um, God, it is eight o'clock. I haven't even spoken to you about the futures, what's happening. So um, let me jump in. Yes, these are both in the barrel. The 19 will only at, at the earliest get bottled next year in, um, in 2021. The 17 gets bottled August 20th. Both are retail at $74.95 and the futures discounts are, um, if you're a gold member and a gold member is 25% uh, your normal discount, you're getting this wine for 30%. If you're a silver member, you normally get 20, you're getting this wine for 25%. And again, if you're not a wine club member, um, and by God, you should be, you know, we'll give you 10% because we really appreciate you. We want you to get these wines in the glass. So again, $74.95, it's on the website keswickvineyards.com if you have any issues with ordering wine on the website give our tasting room a call text me text al email al call al any time of the day call the boss two in the morning he will take your phone call call my wife call cindy at three in the morning she's generally up um, we want you to have these wines you need to have these wines if you're a lover of beautiful wines and you don't mind waiting a little bit That'd be incredible. Tasting room, um, call Sarah or Karen in the tasting room. Be happy to, to get them out. So, the are yeah, fantastic. And um, Kath reminded me. Thank you so much. The futures from the previous weeks are back up on the website. If you missed the opportunity to get the Merlot and the Merlot Reserve, it's on the website. If you missed the opportunity to get the Cab Franc and the Cab Franc Reserve, it is up on the website. If you get six bottles, shipping is for free. Um, the other thing you can do is order it and come visit us. And if you're a gold member, come get your free glass of wine and free flights and pick the wines up. I know uh, the one thing I would say is shipping wines right now while it's hot, um, be a little bit careful. You know, we want to make sure that these wines get to you 
in in the best best condition possible as well um let's see so uh, suzanne barber says what kinds of changes do you typically see as vines age smaller harvest more tannin is two years enough time to perceive those changes uh, that is a, a phenomenal phenomenal question um i find young vines are incredibly vigorous they're incredibly vegetative and um you know which could work advantageously you know if it's a dry vintage you get a lot of leaves and a lot of shoots um and you get that photosynthetic potential and potentially with a, a lower crop because it's not going to produce a lot of fruit in the first year or two you might get incredible fruit but the balance is not quite there the flavors are not quite developed the root system is not as developed so you get a lot of vigor um, you know, you can get really, really sort of tannic, but you get grapes and chemistries that are just a little out of balance. It really takes a vine 5, 10, 15, 20 years to, to really, I think, become balanced. Now, remember, I, I always want to say this, that we're, we're not grape growers, meaning that we don't sell the fruit that we grow. Because at the end of the day, if we were grape growers, tonnage is important because people pay by the ton. Right? We're wine growers and we have soils that are so poor on sites that are, are so poor that as a grape grower we would struggle. So we're wine growers. Um, and yeah, what I what I do for them at the, the older vines, they're balanced, you know, they have perfect fruit to sort of um, leaf ratio, they're not overcropped, the berries are small, which is what you want. Smaller berries means more concentration. Bigger berries means more juice but more dilution. Um, but that's a really, really, really great question. Do you see it in two years? I find that I've really seen sort of the evolution of the wines, you know, from about five years on. The wines are really good and they've got color, but they're just not quite in sync. You know, everything's a little bit disjointed. Um, so there is value, in my opinion, to be working with, with vineyards that are a little bit older as well. Uh, let's see what else is there. Uh, Can I talk about the August tasting? Yeah, so the August tasting. Next week, by the way, um, we are trying to hammer down a special guest. So we are going to have someone join me to talk about wine and it's just a, a really fun conversation you know we we haven't sort of hammered him down yet we we placed a, a call um so we'll let you know on our facebook page on our website but the august bundle and we thought you know what we we don't get to taste wines that have a little bit of time in the in the bottle so the august bundle which is 99 dollars with free shipping is the 2018 v squared the 2018 estate reserve uh, Rosé, the 2017 Trevelyan White, which was a blend of two Viennese, two Chardonnays, Vidal, Chaminet, and Verdeo, and the 2018 Levon d'Ange Viennier. Summertime, bright, but with a bit of age. So just sort of changing it up a little bit as well. It's also on the website. It's $99, and uh, shipping is free to you. Again, if you want to come visit us and pick it up, we would, we would love to have it. Um, Laura says, I would say Keswick makes the best Virginia cab. Laura, that's extremely kind. Checks in the mail. Um, the brown envelope should be on your porch. But thank you so much. We, we really appreciate it. Um, Tracy France, normally can't drink cab sab, but we are loving this. Can't wait to order more. We, we really, really appreciate it. And again, Adam, if Virginia cab sab struggles in most cases. These do not. Again, all credit to, to our, our team, our vineyard staff. And, and again, you know, we were blessed and we're advantageous in that we have this really lovely site, this sort of micro and miso climate within the Monticello AVA that, um, you know, really allows us to grow the kind of fruit that really allows us to make these these kind of wines. So I, I love the fact that um, you, you dig them and you enjoy them. So let's see what else is there. Um, Beth says, I've still got some of the 14. Hang on to them. You know, if you've got two bottles, you know what, Beth, why not drink one now and drink one in a year? And, and, and again, you've got these 17s and 19s coming your way. So, so don't be afraid. There's always another bottle. There's always another vintage. So don't be afraid to drink the wine. Again, as long as you enjoy it, share wine with people you enjoy being around. So uh, Drew says, I, I love the 17 more. Um, I, you know, I do too. But I, I, I see why people would love this 19 right now. It's it's just more sort of vibrant and the aromas pop out at you and it's it's juicy and it's fruity and it's got this really lovely sort of brightness and vivacity to it but the 17 the 17 is just mysterious you know um it, it's it's sort of not showing you everything and, and you want to find out more you know there's a story that they're not telling you there's there's a character that they just they're not sharing with you right now so i think the 17 is a special wine 
but it's a wine that you really should sock away for a, for a couple of years but this 19 god you could almost bottle it right now it's so bright and beautiful it's a it's a pretty wine mm. all right chris says the 17 is luscious with dark chocolate right now love that um and chris it's good to see you. i hope you're doing well uh let's see what else there is um what is it about the 17 that makes you think the 17 is going to be better uh, i know so many winemakers rave about the 19 vintage um you know erica that's a great question yeah 19 was a phenomenal vintage there's no doubt about it um we're getting ready to bottle you know on thursday and friday the merlot the cab franc and the petit Verdot, and they are exquisite but 17 was too I like, I just like the balance and the restraints and the elegance of the, of the 17. You know, this is, this is very flashy and showy and, and it's getting a lot of heads turned. You know, you have a, you have a sort of quiet room and a loud person walks into the room and it's like, and everyone turns. That's the 19. You know, the 17 is the wine sitting in the corner that has a lot to talk about. It's very intellectual. It's very, you know, which I love, you know, it's very intellectual. It makes you think there's more to this wine than you get right now. But I, I agree. The 19 today is certainly the much more sort of vibrant and the one that stands out as well so um they're different you know i i i would love it if the 19 were better than the 17 because i love the 17 and i i want the 20 to be better than the 19 and so on and so forth and that's always the uh, the goal the intention and hopefully is the reality down the way erica says bro vineyards makes a cap set fantastic um, I love Jen Bro and Paul Bro. Uh, they do a wonderful, wonderful job up in Northern Virginia. Go check them out. Uh, I didn't know they made Cab Sav, so thank you, Erica, for that as well. Um, Tracy says, I just tried it with chocolate. Yum. Fantastic. Again, we, we, we haven't spoken about foods. Um, you know, we want to make wines that you can drink, but obviously, you know, you're, you're, you're dealing with sort of meats and grilled meats and spices and anything. You know, Cabernet is such a versatile kind of food friendly kind of wine as well uh cheryl says your cab franc is the best as well well cheryl you're extremely kind and i'm i'm thrilled um at the cab francs that are coming your way really 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 soon so um yeah uh let's see if there's any other questions we'll finish up we'll just recap about um i know there's some questions about the wine club um about the august tasting what's in the wine club shipment uh so let's see if we can take one or two more questions so Chrissy asked the differences you're seeing in the wine. Is it predominantly due to the difference in the growing year or the difference in the age of the vine? Ah, so uh, is that from Chris? Sean Boo? Uh, Chris, the, the age of the vine, obviously the 19 was two years, you know, the vine is two years older than was the 17. It comes from the exact same block. I think what you're, you're tasting right now is vintage variation, but more importantly, I think you're tasting sort of production variation. The, uh, they're both in 500 liter barrels. The 19 is um, in newer barrels. The 17 is in neutral barrels. So I think you're getting to that. The one thing that does stand out is the acidity. And I would say that's probably a hallmark of the, of the vintage. You know, um, again, I don't have the chemistry in front of me, but the, uh, the acidity and the brightness of the 19 is really enthusing and, and lovely. So um, I think partly, partly vintage in terms of the acid, but I think mainly, you know, just in terms of the production, um, production right now as well. Um, let me explain because there was a question about the wine club. You know, again, we, we did a little video on Sunday to talk about the wine club, but if I may, and I don't know I'm running over, so please stick with me and bear with me. But the wine club is, is not just a club. For me, it's, it's, it's a family and it's a community. And what I mean by that is, you know, we've gone to dinner with so many wine club members. We, we, we talk so regularly with wine club members. We love our wine club members. And when you join our wine club, we want to make sure that you join our family. We want to make sure you enjoy the community. Again, we know there are a lot of options out there. There are incredible wineries making incredible wines, um, and you should support them. Um, but what is the wine club? You, you're getting two bottles a month. You know, if you're a gold member, if you want to be a silver member, you get two bottles every other month. But here's the cool thing. I know the six months, the wines that are coming your way, you know, um, this weekend you're getting a Chardonnay Estate Reserve and a Cabernet Franc that is just to die for. And then in the subsequent months, you're getting Heritage, Cab Sav, Petit Vido, Block 7, Reserve Wines. If you take all of those bundles over the six months, you know, the retail on that is $90 and uh, you're getting it for $50. You know, um, come and pick it up at the, in the tasting room. Come get a free glass of wine and a, and a, free, and a free flight, Monday through Friday. You know, additional discounts. You know, you get 25% if you're a gold member, 20% if you're a silver member. 
The other thing is we're making wines just for you. You know, our experimental wines, you know, the wines that are block designates, you know, we're making just enough to send you a bottle. And that's just because we value you. You know, we appreciate you and we want to make sure that not only do we treat you like family, like our own, we want to make sure you get incredible discounts, access to incredible wines, but you feel you have a say in the wine. Oh, you do have a say in the wine because you can come blend wines with up at our consensus. Yeah, I know COVID has screwed everything up um, and, and things are a little bit different right now. But as soon as we get through this and get through this, we will. We will welcome you back and we'll get back to those wine club, the appreciation event, the consensus, the walking tours, all of which you get at, at discounted rates. So again, you know, you know, do what you feel comfortable. There is value, no doubt, to being part of the wine club. But we know that um, you have options. And as long as you support Virginia wine, I'd be I'd be happy. Um, again, what you're getting, the, the 2019 Chardonnay Estate Reserve and the 2019 Cabernet Franc. Uh, the Chardonnay is just beautiful. If you love Burgundy, Montrachet, or Chassagne Montrachet, or Pouligny Montrachet, or Chablis even, uh, the Chardonnay is going to really be up your attic. It, it's not big and oaky and buttery. It's vibrant. It's citrusy. It's stone fruit. It's minerally, and the oak is very just sort of on the back. And then the Cabernet Franc. Oh, Cabernet Franc is spicy, and it's decadent, and it's fruit forward, and it's extracted. Both are going to be beautiful. And again, um, you should get an email. We're doing a Zoom chat mid-August where we're going to open those wines together and we're going to do more of an interactive chat about those wines as well. Um, and then the other thing is uh, about the wines. And Al's telling me to shut up. So I will oblige, boss. Give me a few more minutes. But all the stuff's on the website. All the futures, all the discounts. Um, oh, he's saying shut up. No. Um, so please call Al Schoenberg. Uh, if you want his number, I'll give it to you. Like I said, he doesn't go to bed before six o'clock in the morning, so uh, give him a call at any time of the day. Um, Rick says, I'm calling out, oh, please do. But he's asleep right now, Rick. You should call him at about two in the morning. That's when he's up. Again, just, just visit our website. Visit our Facebook page. You know, Like us on our Facebook page. Spread the message. Tell people you love Virginia Wines. Support Virginia Wines. So um, there's one or two more questions, and then let's just finish up, and then we'll go from there. Um, Beth says, so basically, if you have to be up with the baby, everyone has to be up too. Well, um, if that's free babysitting, we, we will take it. But um, nothing like uh, being up at two or three or four in the morning. But I've got to be honest, you know, that's mainly my wife. And God bless her for doing 99% of the work, you know, allowing me to do all of this stuff as well. So um, is there one time for one last question, sweetheart? Uh, are you going to go to... Okay. All right, let's do two more questions. Um, all right two questions are we making a single varietal petite for dough absolutely um we bottled that on friday so july 31st we're bottling a beautifully dark and inky and extracted petite for dough as far as the 2016 i'm not 100 percent sure we might have a few bottles uh sneaking and, and hunting around so what i would do don't get on the website give our tasting room a call 434 Two four four three three four one extension one o five. I'm not sure who the manager is on duty tomorrow. Give us a call. Let's uh, let's see if we can find a couple for a few there as well. All right. Um, so I'm not sure on that, but we are definitely making a single varietal uh, petite verdot. So yeah, just a couple of shout outs again, Mrs. Woodman in Australia. Um, God bless you and your family. It's so lovely to see you on here after so many many years. Rick Tag. Um, you know, just a, a super guy up in, uh, up in, is a Della Plain, I think so. You know, check him out. Incredible wines up in Northern Virginia. Super, super, super guy. Really entertaining. And uh, you should check them out. And you should go and visit him as well. Um, to all our wine club members, you know, some of which I, I probably haven't mentioned yet. But, you know, the Lynn Pantos, the Janice Bryant, the Susan Glenn. Um, all of you folks who, who just join us week in and week out, we so appreciate it. And remember, I don't know if you remember this, but anyone that had ordered three or six bottles of wine is going into a drawing. Um, and we're going to pick out a, a name um, to do a private uh, vineyard walk and tasting with me. So six people, your couple and four of your friends. So we'll, uh, we'll do that next week. Um, and again, we'll let you know who's going to join us on the show. So I uh, also want to finish up and again and just say, look, Folks, I hope you guys are doing well. Um, I hope you're happy. Again, you know, we, we talk about how 
all we can do is control ourselves and be the best we can be so i just want to say thank you i'm going to say thank you to to you your support your well wishes thank you to and a happy anniversary to my beautiful wife from our family which is you know us and then our extended family you know which is you and al and cindy and our, our keswick family we so 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 um appreciate you guys and and what you do hopefully you you love these wines and again oh someone saying you know we we got to finish up um <laughs> this little monster is getting big you know almost 11 pounds doing well um he's a little sort of fussy at night but for those that haven't seen him yet there's mr alakai um alakai say hi to everybody say say hello wave he's really waving Mwah. we hope we can see you at the winery soon um but yeah everyone says what is the best thing you ever made and uh this is one of them aria being the other and uh if our wines can be half as good as those then then we're in good shape so let me put this down put this down god he's not a he's not an object but there's our little boy Mwah. god bless you um and then let me say goodbye and um you know it's it's only six days and 23 hours until we see each other again so um let me get a glass i hope you love these wines i hope you're learning something i hope uh i hope you're drinking beautiful wine and i and i, I know you're supporting virginia and all of us you know all the wineries in the monticello ava and the eastern shore and down you know in the south and shenandoah and northern virginia is we support and appreciate your support so keep drinking local support the cideries the distilleries the breweries the restaurants um you know it is uh yeah it <laughs> it's a tough time hey boss i'm i'm sorry but uh i figured you'd be happy to to chat to our wine club members as well so hey you know everyone's saying thank you for doing this no guys seriously thank you thank you for allowing us to do this thank you for allowing us to make the wines thank you for indulging me i know i have verbal diarrhea sometimes uh, it's just because we're passionate it's just because we enjoy and love what we do um so get on the website take advantage of the discounts come say hi when you can we would love to see you and until next week um you know and again check us out uh, we'll announce who we have on the show and then don't uh, don't forget about the the august bundle um i look forward to seeing you we'll get the bottling done we have some incredible wines coming your way and check that email out for the Zoom uh, Wine Club exclusive virtual kind of get together or chat sometime soon. So until then, God bless, be great, bless all your families and have a wonderful, wonderful day, week, weekend. And I will see you right here again in six days and 23 hours. See ya.